Hi, so in the previous video we looked at deriving the expectations augmented Phillips curve and that had some, some issues where we tend to be looking at backwards looking inflation expectations when we use that curve and so when we assume that individuals have rational expe expectations then the inflation or the expected inflation rate has to on average be the correct inflation rate and so it, it wasn't really backed up by the empirical data and it broke down in a number of key periods in, of history. So what happened in the 1970s and 1980s is there was a different way of looking at the Phillips curve and that's what we're going to derive in this video where we look at the Calvo Ferry method and he derived this method in his 1983 paper and basically what this says is that some fraction of firms are able to change their price in each time period and everyone else or the other firms have to have a fixed price in this time period and we can call this fraction of firms theta that is able to change their price and they're going to be setting their price optimally so we've got firms that are wanting to choose their optimum price each time period but only theta of them are able to do that and this theta is completely random so each time period we can view this as effectively uh, each firm they have a probability theta that they're able to optimally choose their price and with probability 1 minus theta they have to stick with the same price in the previous period so what does this mean for our aggregate price level? Well, it means that our, if we look at the natural log of the price level, well, there's going to be a portion theta of firms that are choosing their price level optimally, so we'll call that PT star, and then one minus theta firms are just, they still have the price level from the previous period, the price level in period T minus one. So our aggregate price level is just a weighted average of these values because we have identical firms so we can aggregate their price levels such that we just have all firms either choose this one PT star or the rest of firms choose this or they have this price level from the previous period and what we can do with uh, this aggregate price level is I've just expanded out this this bracket in the next line and then subtracted the natural log of the price in period t minus 1 and we've done this because as I mentioned in a previous video the natural logarithm of price in period t minus the natural logarithm of price in period t minus 1 well that's just the differences in these two price levels over the two periods so that's just the inflation rate in period t and we have this on the other side as well but this is the optimal price level so this on the right hand side becomes the uh, optimal inflation rate or pi t star and so our inflation rate is just going to be this um, fraction of the optimal inflation rate and intuitively this makes sense because uh, theta uh, fraction theta of firms are changing their price level whereas the remaining for the remaining fir firms, they're just keeping this price level sa the same. So for these firms, the inflation rate is just going to be zero. So we, our inflation is just some fraction of the optimal inf inflation rate. So what we're interested in deriving our new Keynesian Phillips curve, we're interested in the choices that are made by the firms which are able to change their price because it's not it's not all too interesting. Um, thinking about the choices of the firms who aren't able to change their price because they're just going to keep their price the same. So what will be the inflation rate from the firms who are able to change their price? Well, it will have something like what we derived in the previous video. The optimal inflation rate is going to be the inflation rate in period T plus the elasticity of labor supply minus one multiplied by the output gap. And we got this relationship in the previous video when we were looking at the expectations augmented Phillips curve so you can check out that to see how we micro founded this relationship but okay so the optimal pi t star is going to be equal to this 
and we can then link this to the actual inflation rate, which is just going to be the fraction theta of this uh, optimal inflation rate. So now we are going to consider, again considering the firms that are changing their price, but we are going to make some assumptions about them, and these, these assumptions seem fairly reasonable of the way that firms would act given the conditions. Obviously it's not particularly reasonable that we just only allow certain firms to change their price each period, but I'll discuss that at the end of the video. But we are going to have firms minimizing some loss function from being unable to change their price in future periods. And this makes sense because say the firm is able to change its price today so it can choose PT star, but what actually is PT star? What is the optimal price level given that in period t plus 1 there's a 1 minus theta chance that they're going to be stuck with PT star? And in the, then in period t plus 2 there's a 1 minus theta squared chance that they're still going to be stuck with this price level. And this goes off to infinity. Obviously there's a declining probability that they're going to be stuck with this um, price level in the future, but we, we could get to time period 50 and there's very low probability they're stuck with this, but they're, they're still going to, if they're choosing the optimum price level, they're going to take this probability into account. So this PT star is not necessarily just the optimum price for this period, and they're not just maximizing profits for this period, they're minimizing their losses for all future periods, but they're discounting uh, the probability that they're still stuck with this price. So as I say here, firms are not sure when they're next able to change their price, because there's some probability in every period that they're never able to change their price again. So they, yep, yeah, I've written this down, they set the price today based on the probability that this is their price in all these future periods, and we're also going to have the firms discounting the future. So their profits today, they they make profits in pi t, they'll, they'll just weight this with um, with a discount factor 1, because that, that's how they value profits today, whereas profits in the future, they may value at a discounted rate, we'll say discount it by psi, and as we go into time period t plus 2, we'll have psi squared, and so on. So we discount future profits to some extent, and um, there's a number of reasons why we discount the future. Individuals tend to do it in reality, and firms will also do it in reality. So that seems like a reasonable assumption to make as well. So given all of this, we get this sort of optimal inflation rate that looks something like this equation here. And we have an infinite sum, which is given from period t to period infinity. And we are discounting our inflation rate or the choice of inflation by by uh, these um, expressions here. Now what, what do we mean, why do we have these expressions? Well we've got uh, the first one, let's move this over here, we've got 1 minus theta to the power of i, so this is our probability that we're going to be stuck with this price in each period, and so in period 1 this is going to be just 1 minus theta, and period 1 is just going to be i equal to 1, and in period 2 we're going to have 1 minus theta squared because i is equal to 2 and so on. So this is the probability that we're, we sell this price in these future periods and so this, this is effectively our loss function that if we're stuck with our price we're going to be making some sort of loss because we're not at our optimal price level in that period. We also have this psi term also raised to the power i, again we're discounting the future so we're sort of discounting the future in two ways in this loss function where for one there's a declining probability that we're actually going to still have the same price in the future and it's declining at a constant geometric proportion or a constant geometric rate of 1 minus theta but we're also discounting that future utility on top of it because we don't care as much about our future profits than we do care about profits today so we also discount at this rate psi and it's pretty reasonable to say that psi is going to be less than one here and then we just multiply this by our inflation rate in period t plus i and of course these are all this inflation rate is in the future so we're taking expectations of it 
uh, given our period t information. And what I've just noticed is that there should actually be a pi t plus i star here because we're talking about the firms that can actually choose their price in each period and we know they're going to choose them optimally. So their, their losses in the future are coming from how this, how the inflation rate or the price that they choose in the in period t will differ from the optimal price that they'd want to choose in period t plus one, t plus two, and so on, but they were not able to choose. And at the start of the video, we noted down this relationship between pi star and just and pi just normal pi and we noted that it looked something like this I've evaluated it at time t plus i so that we can substitute it in here and we derived this result in the previous video and so we can substitute this into our pi star in our equation here in order to start to look at actually deriving the New Keynesian Phillips curve and getting it in a form that we are actually used to. And so once we substitute that in there, that we'll see the next line of working. And nothing too particularly interesting about this line of working. But what we can do with this is we can expand out our infinite sum. Well, we can't actually expand our infinite sum out because there are infinitely many terms. But if we were to start expanding out an infinite sum, it would look like this. So in time t, we would have this uh, term expanded out, which looks similar to what we had originally, that pi t star is equal to pi t plus gamma minus 1 multiplied by the output gap in time t. But we are considering the possibility that we could have um, this price stuck with us for any number of future periods. So we then have the probability that we still have this price in period t plus 1, which is 1 minus theta, and we have it discounted by psi, and then we have this same equation, which is which I wrote in blue over here, but this is now in the future, this is in period t plus 1, so we're taking expectations of our inflation rate, and we're taking expectations of our future output gap, which is given by y t plus 1. We have to just predict what we think this output gap is going to look like. And this should be discounted by, yeah, I've got that outside. We've got it discounted by psi, okay? And I've put, put plus dot dot dot. We could, we could also have that we have our next term will be 1 minus theta squared multiplied by psi squared. And then we'd be taking expectations of inflation in time t plus 2 and so on and we would multiply this by or we would add to this our gamma minus one term we'd be taking expectations of the output gap in period t plus two and so on and this could go on for infinity where we keep discounting these and what i will not do is continue to do all the workings and rearranging to actually get this in a form that we recognize as a phillips curve because it requires us to do a lot of tedious algebra, take a number of expectations to get it in a form that looks like the new Keynesian Phillips curve. What the intention with this video is just to give the intuition behind where this comes from, the assumptions we have made, and, and how it's derived, but I will not be going through the hundreds and thousands, well that's an exaggeration, but the lots of algebra that it takes. Instead, I will just write down the new Keynesian Phillips curve, which is derived using the calvo ferry method. And this is it. And it says that our inflation rate in time t, which is what we look to get in our Phillips curve relationship, is equal to psi, so our discount factor, multiplied by our expectations of future inflation, plus our plus this constant term which is given by our elasticity of labor supply multiplied by our theta over one minus theta so the number of firms that have fixed price levels and the number of firms that are able to vary their price does matter here multiplied by the output gap so this looks very similar to our expectations augmented phillips curve 
but it does have a number of differences. The key difference here is that we have this uh, expectations of future inflation here. So we have forward-looking expectations of inflation, which matters a lot because under rational expectations, we no longer have to have that our inflation in time t is equal to our expected inflations in time t plus 1. So we can actually have an output gap in, in the future, and so we have room for monetary policy to play a role in this economy, and more specifically, we, there is, it is very important that we have a credible central bank um, making policies, because if we don't have a credible central bank that's changing, that if the central bank says that it's going to change the money supply but actually doesn't, well, our forward-looking expectations of inflation are going to realise that. So we have to have a credible central bank, just like we do in our major economies, and this is why this um, this New Keynesian Phillips curve came to be, and the, some of the rationale behind it was that we require uh, credible central bank policies because inflation will adapt and it will see things coming from a mile away if we look to exploit the Phillips curve relationship. And it is worth noting that we, we do have this constant term on the output gap, which is given by parameters that we can estimate. We can estimate theta as the fraction of firms that do keep their prices constant each period. And that, that is one of the issues with this model, that it does make quite a realistic assumption that just we, some by some random chance, each firm or a certain number of firms is just not allowed to change prices and others are allowed to ultimately change their prices. That's not really a micro-founded idea that this is the case. And so what we've done with the calvo ferry method is we've sort of taken this micro-founded idea of sticky prices and the fact that empirical research shows us that firms don't adapt, adjust their prices all that often and we've just taken, we just made this crazy assumption that okay, some fraction of firms are just not allowed to change price in each period. So it sort of abstracts from our micro-founded idea where we've just made this assumption. But okay, we, we can estimate what this parameter is on the output gap and we can thus say what our how our output gap is going to feed into inflation. So that will just about wrap up this video make sure to leave a like if it was at all useful make sure to check out the playlist for future videos on similar topics and to subscribe for lots of future videos